thank you everybody for coming this morning. Um, really excited to be here and to be with all of you and of course to be especially with my esteemed colleagues um, on this panel. Um, I'd like to first introduce you to everybody that you're going to be hearing from this morning and then talk a little bit about um, what we're going to be discussing. Um, so starting on the far right, we have Allegra Smith, who's the Assistant Educator for Digital Learning at MoMA. Um, next to her is Patty Edmondson, and I'm going to try and get this right, the Intergenerational Interpretation Specialist at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Sorry, I'm just realizing I'm giving you feedback. Um, how's that? Is that better? Okay. Um, and then um, next to her and, and myself um, is Rosanna um, Fluti, who is the assistant professor at NYU in the Department of Museum Studies, um, where she teaches graduate uh, level classes in museums and interactive technology. Currently, she is also consulting for the Broad while completing her PhD in urban education at CUNY. Um, her doctorate is in urban education uh, with a focus on interactive technology and uh, pedagogy. So the reason for the long intro for Rosanna is that um, we're kind of going to do a mix of presentations and discussion today in the spirit of the conference and our subject. So we'll do a little bit of um, talking about case studies and the work that's going on and then hopefully having a conversation um, to, you know, involving you guys too. So, um, and Rosanna will be leading that. Um, so, you know, what are we talking about? Well, of course, we all know um, that teens are already making content with digital media. They're curating their own lives um, every day. And, um, you know, I think what's um, critical about this for us is that um, this is a really formative um, period in their lives. We, I think, um, have all at some point had that realization that we are still teenagers at heart in a lot of ways. And I think a lot of that comes from um, the fact that there is just, there's so much growth in our um, personalities, in our, um, our sphere of mentorship and our looking to the adult world during that period of our lives. So it's, you know, it's a hugely formative and important um, stage. And, you know, we're at a, at a stage now in uh, media where, you know, and I, this is no news to anybody, but that teens are really creating their own experiences through media. And we in museums are beginning to think about um, what role we play as part of that um, engagement. Um, I think that um, it's something which, again, is uh, you know, not just part of the uh, museum mission, but really digital literacy is something that is being looked at um, you know, in formal education. And um, I thought it was useful to look at a quote um, from the NMC Horizon Education Report, which points out that you know, digital literacy is information, it's uh, communication, it's content creation, it's um, issues of safety and problem solving. So it's so much more than, you know, perhaps even we talk about in our everydays with the specific technologies that we're discussing, and that there's a real need for this in education. And this report was specifically focusing on Europe, but I think this, you know, obviously applies uh, to us. And I think there's really a role, um, and you'll be hearing from our colleagues about this in terms of the ways in which um, uh, the cultural heritage sector can, as in formal learning spaces, really um, interact with this problem and, and already has been doing. Um, you know, uh, this quote again from Dana Boyd, um, the author of It's Complicated. I'm reading this out because there are members of our audience who are not able to read the presentation from the slide, so apologies for doing a little bit more of the reading out than I, I typically would. Um, but uh, her quote, and she's just you know, an incredible um, thinker, um, but the quote I have here is um, about her uh, perception of, of the role of cultural heritage. She, she says, teens are engaging with social media but don't understand the dynamics and structures. Museums know how to ask hard questions, challenge and question interpretations that hone skill youths need to develop. So I think there's um, really obviously a great fit for our industry and um, this question of, of digital literacy. So um, this is something that museums are really um, doing a fantastic job of thinking about and providing the facilitation and the process for um, creation and for learning about digital literacy. And I think what's really key here is that um, question of co-curating. And in that, it's valuing the end, not the end product, but um, providing the tools for teens to establish their own credibility. Um, thinking about teens not just as actors um, or participants even, but as directing the process and seeing their own influence in that. 
And I think this is really part of an evolutionary cycle in our industry, going from the focus on education, um, curatorial, digital, and the um, incredibly exciting kind of establishment of teen councils at museums into the hard-earned fruits of, of these labors that you'll be hearing about today. You know, this isn't something that's happened overnight. That's, these programs are, are um, you know, have evolved out of this thinking um, that museums have been doing. And it's also at the edge, it's sort of at the bleeding edge of what museums are thinking about. Um, there are natural tensions between what their institutional goals are, what an individual's goal is who might be participating, and even the educator and facilitator roles, and we're going to talk a little bit about those tensions um, today. I think that museums can really validate teens providing these critical skills and a safe space. Um, you know, uh, Rosanna is really the expert on this, but um, you know, I think thinking about informal learning spaces, places to experiment, that what's available to teens at this period of their lives, um, I think museums really have an exciting role um, to fill. Um, I wanted to just touch on this concept of co-curating and co-creation. I think it's important to frame this with some definitions. Um, again, for the purposes of our audience, I'm going to read out a little bit from the slide. Um, in the commercial and kind of entertainment sector, the theory of co-creation is defined as setting up new modes of engagement between individuals and institutions, allowing individuals to insert themselves in the value chain of the organization. So this is really about, um, you know, uh, commercial organizations saying we're not just going to consult with our audiences and ask their opinions but place them in the product development cycle and I think we can think about this as an evolving definition for our own sector that um, the individual in the community is an active agent in content and program ideation and therefore becomes more likely to participate in what's consumed um, is in what's provided um, in terms of the cultural environments and the offerings um, and I think that all of this starts with the invitation. You know, it really starts with how you're inviting your audiences to um, participate. And again, we're going to hear some great examples of that. Um, you know, I think it really sets the tone and it gives the teens a sense of responsibility in this process, which um, I think is really important and is also about um, the, I'm going to borrow a phrase from a presenter yesterday, the ROF, the return on fun, which I think was awesome. Ryan Dodge of the Ontario Museum um, coined that in a presentation yesterday, and I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, as well as, again, kind of coming back to the um, more academic definitions, the authenticity of the learning um, process. So, again, this is a quote from the Horizon Report, which was just published this summer, um, thinking about authentic learning as uh, focusing on real world complex problems and their solutions, using role playing exercises, problem based activities, um, and participation in virtual communities of practice. Um, so. I was going to um, mention just a couple of examples before I hand it over to my colleagues, and I'll keep them brief, um, just because I thought they were good to point out uh, for the benefit of um, kind of um, you know kind of a survey of what's going on. Um, the Brooklyn Museum of Art uh, launched a fantastic project um, with Global Kids this summer called uh, NYC Haunts, where they were working with teens to um, do coding and game making. Um, it's a program that you can download for free, Tailblazer, and um, Rachel Ropek uh, very kindly let me just share the slide of the, um, the programming tool that they used, and um, you know, hopefully we can uh, have another session another time when she could actually come and appear. But I think what's interesting there is, again, a very intensive workshop set up where the teens were really given the, the, the physical tools to um, create the program. They were given autonomy over the subjects that were chosen and the direction of the program and everything from the graphic look and feel to the content. Um, at MAM, uh, the Milwaukee Museum um, Art Museum, a, a very different example, but I wanted to point this out because their teen media program uh, run by Chelsea Kelly, um, Chelsea Kelly is um, uh, really interesting. It's uh, a, about video production, but it's um, working on video with iPads, and I think what's interesting about that, she's thinking a lot about the evaluation side of what we do and how to determine the value of um, the, the impact on museums. So, I think from there, I'm going to summarize and hand back over to um, my, my co-panelists, and beginning with Allegra, who's going to get us right into um, digital learning. So without further ado, Allegra Smith. Hi. 
Hi, good morning. So um, I am going to be talking about the team programs that we run at MoMA and most specifically the online courses. So just to give some background, um, MoMA has a very successful team program um, that's run through our education department and we really stress the importance of engaging with our teens. And in the past, we've really only been able to do this on site. Um, so we have two programs that we offer multiple times a year. They're called In the Making and the Cross Museum Collective. Um, unfortunately, these are only open up to New York City based teenagers and <clears throat> they're all free. The teens come on site, they get you know snacks and metro cards. Um, but the issue that we realized is that we get over 300 applicants for 100 slots per season. So about a year ago, um, the assistant associate director of teen programs called her Zwicky and I kind of sat down and we realized that this was an issue and um, I currently work in uh, as a pro production manager for all of our other uh, online courses and so we kind of threw around this idea of what would it be like to create an online course for teen and would there be interest in doing this. So, um, you know, we started by going through some of the content in our other online courses, finding things that were really approachable. Um, so we did a week on Cindy Sherman, a week on Salvador Dali, and just kind of repurposed all this content to see if the interest was out there. So um, we didn't really do any advertising for it. We put one post up on Facebook and we had 45 students sign up for it. So over the course of five weeks, we worked with these students. Um, and it was really great because it, there were some very enriching discussions that came out on this online platform and we realized that the interest was there. So after that, we kind of figured out, well, you know, could we do this program and really work with teens to create content that was for teens, by teens, and then have the teens themselves teach the course. So over the series of nine months, um, we brought in nine teens who had been part of a season of in the making on-site courses and we paid them a small stipend to come in every Friday from 3.30 to 6.30 and work with us. Um, you know, again, we gave them snacks, we gave them Metro cards, and we paid them. And so, you know, we started by introducing how MoMA teaches um, on-site and also introducing the idea of online learning and made them take the course that uh, we put together as our pilot course. and. You know, afterwards we sat down and we're like, okay, well, what were some of the successes? What did you like? What didn't you like? And most importantly, if you were going to take an online course, what would you want to learn about? So, you know, it started by doing the content development with them and realizing we had so many great resources at MoMA. Um, and so we kind of worked together and really let the teens run with their ideas. Um, you know, we wanted all this to come from their voice. So instead of us coming up with ideas and telling them, okay, now let's film you doing this, instead we had them storyboard everything and we supervised them. And then at the end, that's when we kind of worked together to put everything together. So you can see on the far left here that uh, this is actually them working and doing the workshopping and taking the course. And then after we storyboarded everything, we hired a video artist who's based in Brooklyn named Elise Santana. And, um, we decided to film everything with the green screen because we thought that instead of you know having this limitation of what can't we do, we were more like, okay, well, what can we do with this green screen? Time and place no longer became an issue when we were filming. Um, and the other great thing was Ali had done a lot of work with MTV in the past, so he had a very like glitchy, fun, youthful aesthetic, which really worked well with our teens. Um, so you can see then on the far right, we've got uh, Frida Kahlo up in the top corner there. Um, and then we also did this video about like the Flex is for and uh, you know, face transformation. So um, this is what the teen course looked like when it was done. Um, what was great about the first iteration of the course, it was called Think Inside the Box. And what we decided to do was have this hands-on physical component with it. So in the upper right corner, you can see there was actually a box with mystery materials in it. And so every week they had an envelope or a smaller package that was sent to them for free. And um, you know the students enrolled would find an object in there that correlated with that week's worth of content. So for example, uh, the week on conceptual art, we gave them a fortune cookie that said no um, inside to just kind of toy with that idea of annoying art and conceptual art and thinking about what challenges people. Um, so another thing I wanted to point out to you that although all the content was created by the teens, um, Calder and I were the ones that were building the course itself. And that was for many reasons. Um, we wanted to make sure there was a heavy educational component to it. So these videos are lighthearted, but at the same point in time, we wanted to include artist biographies 
definitions from MoMA Learning and other resources we have on MoMA.org, and also make sure that students were learning about art as well as, you know, we can introduce it in a fun and engaging way, but we want to make sure that people are really understanding the art as well. Um, so, you know, it, it was really great, and um, it ended up being a very successful course. We had, again, 75 students enroll in it, but what we realized was we had that limitation. Because there was that physical component, we had to cut off how many people we accepted. And we we're like, well, isn't that the whole reason that we were creating online courses to begin with? So this past spring, we decided to do a second iteration, and we invited some of our students that had worked with us last year um, on our teen advisory board. Um, to come back, but also invited new students that were enrolled in uh, previous uh, in the making courses from this last year. And we worked with them again to kind of introduce them to the idea of online learning and what it was like, and then also have our teen alumni, you know, share their stories about co-creating content with us. And um, from there, we decided to shift the topic a little bit, and instead of having the hands-on art making component, we uh, decided to film and interview a lot of Brooklyn-based artists. So this course ended up manifesting into what's happening in the New York art scene right now. Um, but what's great about that is this is a very international course. Um, we have over 266 students enrolled in it right now. It launched on November 1st, and from that we're represented in like 15 or 20 countries. So that was really exciting for us to have that international reach. And actually one of uh, the students that's enrolled in the course reached out to an artist recently and said, you know, I'm this young girl, I'm 13. I live in Mexico, I'm coming to New York for the first time, and I'm really inspired by your art. Like, can you give me some galleries I can check out? Or can I meet with you to talk to you more about your practice? And so that was really rewarding for us to see that. Um, so before we get into a little bit further discussion about the LMS and what platform we use, I just want to show you guys a quick uh, video from the course to get a better sense of the content. Okay. All right, so this one is, can you see my cursor on the screen there? All right. Oh, shoot. I just start this from the beginning there. Sorry about that. Oh, my God. Emily, look at that art. It is so abstract. It looks like one of those minimalist paintings. But you know, who understands those paintings? They only look at them because they want to look totally cultured, okay? I mean, that painting, it's just so conceptualized. I can't believe it's just so weird, or so out there. I mean, what? What? It's just so... I like wild. good art, and I cannot lie. You other artists can't do that. The culture walks into the gallery to see a display case, they get hyped. So you can see there's a very uh, teen-driven <laughs> aesthetic here. Um, so that was Emily. Uh, she's our superstar. She, we actually decided to pay her another stipend to teach this course and really facilitate the discussion going through it. Um, and you know, this is the other amazing thing about these kids is once the creation of the course ends, they still want to be really involved. And they're still going into the discussion forums weekly, interacting with each other, but interacting with the other students enrolled. So, um, you know, this is just one of the landing pages. As you can see, it's very youthful and colorful. This is not what our typical online courses look like, but we had the teens really work with us um, to upload the content. And you can see, like, that was a very fun and humorous video here, but we wanted it to be educational still. So um, to the right are the lyrics for the kids to go back and read everything and everything 
something has a glossary term associated with it. And those either link to MoMA.org, MoMA Learning, which is our educational um, website that we created, um, and also to have artist bios and images and things like that. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what we do. Uh, we're in our third week now. Um, the students are still posting works of art that they're creating, uh, and we post those onto our MoMA Teens Tumblr blog, so they feel like they're kind of getting that sense of co-creation as well um, and curation. So that's what we do. <laughs> Um, I think so. I think um, we weren't really sure how many people would be interested in the course, to be completely honest. We don't do any advertising or marketing. We post it on Facebook, we post it on Twitter and Tumblr. Um, and I believe Calder took one ad out, which was on Facebook and geared for other teens that age. So I think the reason we capped out at 75 was just what was left in our budget, to be completely honest, after we paid for everything else. Um, and then also just not knowing how many people would want to enroll in it. So our first prototype course, we had 45 kids. So we're like, all right, well, if we anticipate having that number or around there, we'll make extra boxes just in case. And then if not, we'll have like these archival materials. And we ended up having to just, you know, use them all, which was fantastic. But um, yeah, I think we'd definitely be open to it. We've been talking again about rerunning that course um, or posting that content somebody somewhere else and keeping it free with like a supply list. But I think the issue with that is like that mystery box and that mystery component was such a huge part of the course. Um, and I should also mention that we launch everything week by week, so the teens are not able to go through the whole course at the time they log in, and they have to log in on Saturdays to get the next week's of con worth of content. Yeah. Sure. Um, do you have any demographics on the um, Yes, so we keep, um, the first time we ran the course, we decided to do it for kids that were 13 to 19. And what we saw was a lot of kids in college were enrolling in the course. And it really changed discussion a lot. Um, I think the younger kids were more intimidated knowing, because we have them introduce themselves when they first log in. And I think the younger kids were more intimidated to have conversations with students that were in college. So it really shifted that mindset. Um, so when we offered this a second time, we said no one under the age of 13 and no one over the age of 17. Um, and we use a form called or a survey system called Wufu, and um, you know kids can fill out their information, and we make them select their age group. And whoever puts other, we email personally and say, "Hey, I'm sorry, we just don't have room for you in this course." And some kids are like, "Oh, I, I just had a glitch when I was enrolling. Like, I swear, I'm 13 years old. I can send you like info if you need it." But um, we, you know, we go in good faith, but we do have like older kids still enroll in it, and we just have to email them and say, "Hey, like, really glad to have your interest. Check out our Tumblr page. Like, I'm sorry, but this is just for high school students." Um, and that was a conscious decision we did after the first iteration ran. Yeah. Yes. Um, did, you, did you get any feedback on the motivation of the students? Um, that's a great question. We um, found that a lot of people. I mean. We have the brand association with us of being MoMA, but also being MoMA teens. And um, our Facebook posts, our Facebook page has you know thousands of followers. I think we're up to like twenty five thousand or something like that. Um, so I think there's really a lot of interest in modern and contemporary art. And I um, don't know that there's a lot of information for teens out there that's very approachable. I mean, it's a difficult subject for adults, <laughs> let alone teens, to kind of wrap their head around. So I think. Um, the fact that it's coming from MoMA, MoMA, the fact that it's geared towards teens, and the fact that it's free uh, really drives people to our site. And it, um, we see this with our on-site courses, too, and our online courses. People like that connectedness. You know, When we film things in the galleries, people like the idea that they can still see what's around them, even though they may be thousands of miles away. Um, and you know, it's great too when they then come on site and we get calls all the time like, hey, I'm in the lobby, like I took one of your courses, would you be willing to meet and talk with me for like half an hour? And of course, like we love that feedback. Um, we do do a lot of heavy surveying as well at the end of the courses. It's a little bit more difficult to get feedback from teens um, <laughs> compared to our other alumni, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Sure. 
All right. Okay, hi, I'm Patty from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, I'm gonna talk about Teen Co-op, which is currently in its second year at the museum. Um, the program is in the intergenerational learning department, which is part of the education and interpretation department at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And so one of uh, the focuses of this department is to, um, as the name implies, get intergenerational groups doing things and learning together. Um, and Gallery One falls um, from an education standpoint within that. So all of the content was produced um, from the intergenerational learning staff. And while we were completing Gallery One, one of our funders uh, said, hey, you know, teens are really awesome with technology, um, which is an assumption that many people have. <laughs> um, not always true. <laughs> um, you, we, you know, we'll, we'll fund uh, this one thing if you guys make a teen docent program. So um, we said, okay, um, that, that idea felt a little one-dimensional, but we um, said, let's create a teen program where they will be in Gallery One um, and learn about it and um, be part of the, the sort of team that helps interpret this space, um, but they'll do other things um, that benefit them as well. Um, so this is this year's class. We have 11 students this year. Last year in our first class, we had 10. Um, and the students come from all around Cleveland, and we do try to focus on public school students, uh, and we have a partnership with um, MC Squared STEM School, um, which is part of the uh, Cleveland um, School District. Um, and uh, so they, it's a year-long program, and they have a, they start with a two-week summer session, and they're paid for that time. Um, and that's kind of like the boot camp where they learn to work in Gallery One and work on some projects and train and get ready for the rest of the year. Um, then their primary work throughout the year is to volunteer during our second Sunday family days. And uh, then they also work on some other projects. Um, so like I said, one of the things that they do is they train to work um, in a role that we call the gallery host in Gallery One. And uh, in this position, they learn to facilitate conversations about art, um, but also help visitors if they need help talking about the technology. Um, in reality, often visitors just see the teens in this role as a representative of the museum. They think it's really cool. They just want to talk to them about whatever. Um, so they also create programming and volunteer for Second Sundays, like I mentioned. So here, um, the students learn to create these open-ended projects that they facilitate with visitors, which I think is important because often um, people of all ages see you know, a craft project at a museum and they think um, that it's a really easy thing to create, but um, we really teach them how to create something that's open-ended for a visitor um, and, and that's a challenge um, for them. Um, they create uh, programming for their peers as well. So they hosted a teen night last May and um, they are given a budget and they're in charge of coming up with the activities um, and really running the show. So they design uh, the marketing material. Um, you can see it here in the galleries, they came up with this activity where um, there's a teen artist and um, she's located near our Warhol and she'll draw your portrait in the style of the Warhol. Um, they designed silk screens and silk screened t-shirts in the atrium at the museum. Uh, they created scavenger hunts, uh, a couple other uh, activities at Teen Night. Um, and then they also are going to host this year a couple sort of uh, more informal teen art meetups. Um, this is a proof, um, still a work in progress, of a teen guide that they, they create. And so this year their teen guide is a guide to Gallery One. Um, they chose their theme and the theme was being a teenager. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Yeah, I did not lead them there, I swear. Um, so so uh, for the guide, they chose certain artworks in Gallery One and tried to um, 
relate them to teen life. So there are a couple things that really lend themselves to that. There's a portrait of Anne Frank, who you know passed away when she was a teenager, and um, a, a couple other works. Um, uh, and so this is a print guide, and then there's a PDF on the web that kids can download. <clears throat> and then um, there, one of their sort of culminating projects is also to make a video about an artwork. Um, and we asked them to choose an artwork in Gallery One, and uh, we give them a prompt. And this year's prompt was, how do you connect with the artwork uh, personally? Okay. So um, there's Jeremy with his, his painting. Um, so we start by, um, we prepare for these videos with a lot of close looking, and we spend a lot of time during the first week of the summer session um, without technology, just looking at art, talking about it, um, having these conversations about what we see, um, and letting the teens know that their observations are important and valid, um, and uh, it's an important part of the process. Um, we also prepare for video production um, by showing the teens that we trust them. And so in this example, you can see that um, there's two labels on the wall that are red and blue. And so we asked uh, the teens to write a label about an artwork in Gallery 1, and we put it on the wall. So I think showing them that um, we trust them to create content that goes that is public facing um, helps prepare them uh, for the process. We also prepare by letting them go into the galleries by themselves, unsupervised, and so this image is just a product of some of the things that happen um, when they go and look on their own. And they keep a journal, uh, which I read, <laughs> like a creep. <laughs> um, they know that I read it. <laughs> um, and, and there were several comments in the journal where, um, you know, like, I can't believe how amazing the museum is, and it's really awesome when we get to just be by ourselves. Um, you know, not have lame old Patty um, with us all the time. So, <laughs> um, so it's important, I think, in the preparation to show that we trust them and we're gonna um, create these end products together, um, but that their ideas and observations are important. Um, another way we kind of prep is they use Vine in the galleries. Um, I really like Vine because it's free, it's fast, and um, so if there are problems, um, which the first one I'm going to show you is an example of kind of a learning moment um, where maybe they produce something that uh, really shouldn't be public facing, but we talk about why. Slice. Yeah. So the reason, um, I'm just going to mute that for a second, why this vine maybe wasn't okay is because they're pretending to punch the sculptures. Um, and so this was an example where we just let them go into the galleries on their own and say, you know, make whatever. Um, and this is what they came up with. And they totally get it. Once you say it, they're like, oh yeah, I know. Um, but uh, so sometimes, I'll show you a couple examples of um, when they go into the galleries on their own and I think they produce some good results. Um, <coughs> So this is really simple. Fiona had a fisheye lens on her phone, and so she created this um, sort of time travel from one painting to another. Um, and Fiona was a student who was not super um, verbal. She sometimes had trouble articulating herself. When she was on film, she got very nervous. Uh, but some of the videos, the vines that she created were um, just kind of visually stunning, I think. Um, and so it was a way for her to really shine um, in, using this medium. Um, and so this one and the next one that I'm going to show are when we didn't give any direction. Um, we just let them into the galleries to make what whatever they would um, come up with. So I was surprised to... <laughs> to learn that teens are still watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, <laughs> so, um, and uh, so they recreated this, this scene from that movie, if you've seen it. Um, and then the next one that I'm going to show was um, created with a prompt, and that prompt was um, show us how you, how you view an artwork. Okay, so um, 
during these two weeks, um, we're doing all this stuff, we're getting ready for um, their produced video. And we work with a, an outside production company that the museum partners with. And it's a couple um, really young guys who all the girls have crushes on. And, um, but they have a good rapport with the teens. Uh, and uh, we have a small in-house staff, so we don't always have the capacity to, to create um, videos uh, in-house. Um, so one thing I think you'll notice is that the produced videos are a lot more serious than Vine. Um, one thing that surprised me, um, because in this program, this is the first time that I've worked with teens. Um, they, a lot of them, and we were, Rosanna and I were talking about like, what do we say that makes them want to be adults, like how, where does that come from? Um, a lot of them really, they want to prove, you know, I'm an adult, I'm not a, not a teen anymore, um, I'm serious, like I'm in the museum, I'm creating um, important content. Um, and so that said, all of the 11 videos this year were very different and some did have uh, an element of silly, um, but I'll play uh, one for you. Hi, my name is Mandy Nolan, and this is the Japanese story of well, I think the people, even though they're not the average size of a person, it definitely puts a lot of emphasis on the dragon, which is one of the main points of the story. And you have dragons in everyday life, so you can like relate to it by saying, well, I have somebody who's a dragon, but sometimes I get saved from them with my knight and shining armor. I see myself as being the knight saving myself from my own dragon community, especially relating with school and teachers, but also sometimes I'm the one saving my friends. And every once in a while, my friend will be saving me from the big bad dragon. I think I mostly relate to school, but with making sure that I'm not stressed out, I have a good balance on life with activities and that, but also that I'm not, you know, falling behind with my social life, how I'm not just secluded and I'm out there. I think the age almost makes the story better because I think with age, you find out more about stories, even with like books today and yourself. I mean, as you grow, the more your story continues and you pass on life. Um, so that's what I've got for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you guys have any questions about this program? <clears throat> yeah, Megan. What's the process for teaching, or how long does it take? What's the process for teaching them how to make that video? Um, so I will say that they're not the ones like shooting. Okay. Um, so they are part of the editing process, but um, we, because we have that two-week session, it's really not enough um, time for, for them to learn how to work the, um, the equipment. The production company, they really like to talk to the teens about how um, that kind of stuff works. Um, and I think they would really like to do more teaching, um, and we kind of cut, cut them off sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, so they're part of the editing process and they choose the font and the music um, and uh, they create a storyboard. Um, storyboarding was a big thing and our first year we found that uh, the production company, one of their staff members tried to explain storyboarding mm -hmm. to the teens. Um, and it kind of, I don't, I don't know, it just didn't work the way she did it. So we do a reverse storyboarding with them and we watch short videos and we give them a, a little storyboarding form and um, we talk through it and have them write down like what each um, frame is. And that uh, really worked a lot better this year. So they, um, they really understood the, what storyboarding is and exactly you need to describe like every little bit that you want because we tell them then you know you've got to be able to hand this off to somebody um, for them to make the first draft um, and and understand your ideas so you. yes I actually have a question for maybe both of you guys for you and also for Allegra um, I'm wondering you both kind of sort of 
danced around this a little bit or talked about it a little bit, but I'm wondering about what percentage of the ideas for the content or for the projects that you do come from the teams and, and sort of what, uh, how do you encourage them to come up with these solid ideas? Uh, yeah, um, I can start if you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's a really, it's a tough thing, right? Um, because you want, we try to guide them. So um, when we start with that close looking, they pick their artwork and then they are supposed to spend some time with it and write in their journal. And then um, we have a couple different prompts that help them to look um, uh, like what draws you to it and you know where does your eye go first and how do you connect with it, which is a kind of broad um, question. And then they write about it in their journal, and then we meet together and talk. Um, and they're supposed to share some of their ideas with the group, um, so that their peers, um, but us as well. And I think we try to guide them, um, but um, and try to draw. You know, as an educator, we're trained to sometimes draw more information out of people, um, and we try not to put put the ideas in in their head. Um, I'm sure they're you know. That happens. Um, it's imperfect, but um, so I mean, it's also different with every student. With Maddie, um, I think you know she her mom is a teacher, and um, I don't know. She just had this different mindset. She came up with these ideas. She knew exactly what she wanted to do. She did it, um, and it was really a hands-off kind of situation. Um, but sometimes uh, during filming. Uh, it's good, you know, Seema Rao, who, who's in the back there, um, she and I will, we spend a lot of time talking to the kids beforehand, so then when we're filming, um, the, like one student, Jeremy, he, uh, he said, said this one idea on film, um, and we had talked with him before and knew um, kind of what he had wanted to say, and so we'll stop the, the shooting at, and say, um, you know, I, I know this is, what we talked about before, um, and like you did a great job of saying that. So, but let's talk about it a little bit more, and then let's say that a few different ways and a few different times, and then you'll have some material to choose from um, during the editing process. So, I really, I still kind of danced around your um, question, but um, we we try to let it um, come from their ideas. Um, yeah, I think I would say about eighty-five percent is our teams, and you know, like the last little bit is us kind of cleaning it all up. Um, I think the benefit for us is that we're taking and we're working with teams that have already gone through at least one of our programs before, so they have a sense yeah. of the type of programming we do and kind of what our vision is um, at all time. So. We definitely supervise, but we'll just maybe throw out like a small idea and see what they do with it, and then really let them take it off. Um, sometimes it doesn't work. You know, we had uh, this really great kid who wanted to talk about art and censorship, which you know is fine, but he was bringing it around like art versus porn, and I'm like, I'm sorry, like, we can't. You know, you're dealing with 13 year old kids that are going to take. This course, we have to definitely be sensitive about that. Um, but you know, we're like, all right, well, let's kind of rethink this idea. What can we do here? And like, okay, like, yeah, we'll talk about censorship and art. That's fine, but we're not going to uh, present it in that fashion. So I think, um, you know, some of sometimes we have to. Okay, so we don't really involve the kids in the post-production editing process um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, they storyboard everything ahead of time, so they'll write scripts. And memorize it for us to film them, but when it comes to editing, like we really take that on, and then we bring all the kids back, and we're like, all right, we're gonna do a screening. Like we'll order pizza, get everybody in here, and we'll show you all the videos. The course is done. Like now you can see what the final product looks like. And I think that's for many reasons. Um, I mean, kids uh, are busy, you know, with their extracurriculars, with their homework, with building their portfolio, applying to school, studying. Like, they have a lot going on. So for us, if we can do that and get more of the content structured, um, that's great. And then have them be very active in the final product. So we're just kind of that middle process to get everything completed because, you know, we, we, can, we can get it done. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the creative stuff, we really just leave it up to the kids and we want them to feel like this is all coming from them. Um, we did have one instance last year where um, 
we did a video about what is a wall text and why is a wall text important in you know a gallery and yeah it's up there for a reason but what what is it and <laughs> we had this one kid who just was so unprepared and everything he said was wrong and so like when we went back to edit it we were like like none of this makes sense. Like you, you got to come back to the museum where we got to do some voiceovers here to fix it. Um, so yeah, it, sometimes it doesn't always work, but we just we really want the kids to feel like this is their project. And I think a lot of the videos end up becoming performances in and of themselves. Like we did one that was like an, an artist got talent and artist dating show, and you know they get really into it. And uh, I think. When you're having fun like that and you're still learning, it doesn't really feel that way. And um, I don't know, they're, they're really smart kids and they know what they know and they know how they want to teach it to their peers. Um, so we just really let them run with it. Yeah. Um, I just want to add um, one more thing about that is that we found um, that we often need prompts. Um, because some students are just not used to, like if we said, make a video about anything you want in the museum, that's not enough for some of them. Some it is, but um, they're used to getting a very specific assignment in school often, and um, the open-endedness is difficult for some of them. So I hope their responses to those prompts are their ideas. Um, but, yep. I have two questions, actually. The first, is there intergenerational family involvement and also, how do you handle kids who don't have a BYOD, a, a bring your own device, or? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start with that one first. Um, we have a set of iPods, iPod touches, um, that we use, so they can use those. And there's one, this was an instance, I feel like I've been to a couple sessions about, um, like, just do something until you somebody notices. And like, um, as far as asking for permission, um, they have a Vine account, that's a CM18 like teen co-op Vine account, um, and we give them the password. And that was a situation where we just, we didn't have a, a head of marketing for a while, and there wasn't really a person to answer our request, can we have a Vine account? And so we just made it, and, um, and then they found out about it, and we talked about it, so. Um, uh, but as far as the intergenerational um, experiences, I mean, that tends to come out more in the programming than um, the project, like the, the video projects. So sometimes uh, during family days, we'll do um, uh, some programming that involves using Vine, like a station where there's um, a dress up or a prompt or a photo kind of um, op, and a teen can, can run that and make Vines with families. Um, but uh, most of their work with families happens during um, family days. And what about their own families? I think um, yeah, they they come to family days sometimes to see their kids at work. Um, and uh, during the first year, we had a couple that um, wanted to come during filming, um, which was fine, um, just in the galleries during open hours. Um, so they did come. But I think actually that made the kids more nervous, like, oh, my God, my parents are here. <laughs> um, so, um, but uh, no, so a lot of them talk about their families, like in their content, um, but, um, but they're not part of the projects. Yeah, yeah and I think um, building out that of our on-site programs, we give the kids an opportunity to display all their work at the museum when they're done. So in our Coleman Education Center, we have a big mezzanine that swaps through, and um, we have it blocked off for them so that when they're in the making or cross museum class of courses are done, we actually hang up all of their works and they get the they get to install them working with us and also with the instructors or whomever artists they had um, as an instructor over the course of the period and then we throw a big party and you know we get a bunch of food, we invite all their families there and it's really inspiring to see how passionate they are and how much they want to share with their families and walk them through the process and I, we don't really bring them on site. We've had a couple times where kids have asked us, like, hey, like, my cousin's visiting, can she come? Like, yeah, of course, bring her in. But um, I think they're really excited to show their families the end process, and it's really awesome to see how passionate they are about what they're doing. Great work. Okay, all right, I'm going to pass it over to Sophie. Thank you. Those were um, great presentations. I'm going to um, talk a little bit, um, switch gears slightly, and talk about a program that we were involved in earlier this year. Um, this was at uh, the Noguchi Museum in Long Island, Queens. And 
um, a really incredible um, teen arts council that they have established there. Um, we were lucky enough to um, be working together with um, Rebecca Hertz before she um, left the institution actually and um, brought us in because they had um, established the Teen Art Council and the Teen Advisory Board, pardon me, and were looking for ways to further their digital kind of literacy and involve the teens. Um, it's a really a uh, small program, um, usually about 15 kids, and um, but a very, very committed program. The teens come um, throughout the whole year. They usually start in around November, and um, the program culminates in the summer. And each year, um, the program is different. So they have made a booklet in the past. They have created events. They've kind of every year they switch it up. And we came in after Global Kids had actually done a video project. And um, Rebecca and I, when we were talking about it, were setting up the aims for our involvement. And she said, you know, I'm really thrilled that they got to make video, um, but we'd really like to think about audio and thinking about how um, the teens can really, um, again, ass assert more agency in the process, but also think about the, uh, the value of the content that they're, that they're creating. So um, I think the, the sort of the sub-theme of, um, my talk is really, it's all about the journey and not the destination, which um, came up actually in Lance Wheeler's presentation and we were talking about it yesterday in our accessibility presentation. And I think it, it's, um, again, sort of just part of what I think about in my work. And for the teens actually um, in this program, um, this also actually ended up becoming part of their thinking. Um, so what we actually did was we set up a series of workshops where uh, we came in with um, a lot of different types of workshopping techniques with the teens and we spent you know a few hours with them um, talking about what's the role of audio what's the role of media what's the role of um, kind of uh, content in museums and the Noguchi is a really really special environment it's um, you know single artist museum the work is very abstract um, one would think it would be quite a challenging environment for teens to operate in they were incredibly excited about the environment and already um, when I uh, started the workshops and um, Hannah, we did sort of anticipated this in how we designed it. They'd already spent several weeks with the staff learning about the collection and getting familiar with it. And so by the time I came in to start thinking about our project, um, they were already really able to articulate what they what they felt about the collection, and um, I was absolutely blown away and so impressed. And that had nothing to do with our involvement at all. That was absolutely the um, the museum staff and the educators there. And Amy Boyle um, was the person who subsequently ended up uh, running the program with me at the museum. And she, you know, her, her and her team are just awesome educators. And so. They really spent this time um, helping the teens explore the galleries, uh, get comfortable with it, and so on. And then once we were in our workshopping sessions, we were able to really tackle this question. And so to, to sort of the, the, the discussion that you were having just before, you know, how, how do you create content that's coming from the teens? Well, I think, you know, sometimes it's also about a question of having something to bounce off against, so hearing other content in different environments, radio, um, you know, other museum content, other, mu other audio content that's just nothing to do with uh, the museum environment and being able to contrast those and make their own opinions about them gave them a little bit of um, fuel to, to start their own discussions. We did lots of um, role playing and interviewing techniques and really giving them some skills on how to investigate um, not just the artwork but in each other and their storytelling um, voices and methodologies. Um, but they really didn't need to be led intellectually. I, I must underline that. They were absolutely there in terms of um, what they thought about the art. But we definitely talked a lot about strategies for storytelling and how to um, present information, how to talk about um, you know, everything from structuring a story to um, the different parts of a narrative. And, um, and then it was up to the teens to figure out how they wanted to do this. They could do a podcast, they could do a mobile project. The, the format was entirely up to them and the theme was entirely up to them. And they together determined that this was going to be um, a theme and it was, um, the theme was about the journey to Noguchi. It's quite hard to get to and all of the teens are from different schools around the city. Um, and this is by design. This is how the Noguchi has 
has, has set up the program. And so they talked about the fact that they really wanted this to be about peer-to-peer -peer, um, involvement. They wanted this to be about encouraging teens to come and showing them how special the experience is. They talked a lot about the calmness that they felt at the, at the museum. And, um, and I think this goes back to the sort of safe space um, theme and really thinking about what is it that you're providing in your institution that's really, really different and that's really special that they're not getting anywhere else. And I, I, I think that's really um, pretty extraordinary for, for what museums are able to offer. So as I say, we co-facilitated these uh, workshops with our colleagues at the Noguchi that were very, very much part of it. We had a sound designer come in and we taught um, an editing program called Audacity. It's free, it's, an, you know, um, it's pretty simple, ooh, sorry, pretty simple software, but you can, you know, create uh, great audio on it. And this was really by design so that, you know, the workshops are held every week, um, but similar to what you were saying, Allegra, you know, these te teams have other things to do. There were lots of times when there was, you know, maybe a stalling in the process because they had other stuff going on. And so we wanted them to be able to work on this um, at the laptops at the museum, but also to be able to work on this um, afterwards or to continue working on this after the project was over. So really handing on some tangible skills. And I think, you know, maybe there's a discussion to be had about audio versus video and how easy it is to pick up those skills. And I think it's interesting because I think we all think that it's really easy to create media. And I started the presentation by saying, you know, kids are doing it all the time, teens are doing it all the time. They should be able to create something really awesome. But I think that's very different when you're then putting this museum context in the mix and, and then them negotiating this role as, as storytellers and presenting uh, content um, and wanting to be wanting it to be really good. And I think that there's nothing wrong with that, that the responsibility that they feel really shows in uh, the projects that they did. So they also recorded audio. This is a picture of one of the teens who recorded um, a very abstract soundscape. Um, so the the range of the rate of responses to this theme were also really different. Like some people came up with narratives, some people came up with audio art. And this was one of the most surprising things to me. You know, the teens were not just um, talking about themselves and their own experiences. They wanted to create um, quite poetic responses to the collection, which was awesome. Um, and I don't know whether that was just that particular group of teens or the collection. You know, I think it's very different from the responses I've had with working with teens in the past in other programs, which have really, really focused heavily on narrative. And, you know, I'm hoping that it's part of the effort of just being very open at the beginning of the process. Um, here's one piece that I wanted to play you that is more narrative. That's really like you can hear it. Okay. So I love that piece. I'm sorry, the audio was so quiet, um, but um, it's actually available on um, a micro site. I'll make sure the link is out here um, for everyone to look at afterwards. But um, this was a really a wonderful team that we were working with, and she came up with this beautiful narrative completely, again, on her own. Um, but I will say, to again, to my colleague's points, um, she had the narrative down, but the delivery was tougher for her. She did the recording um, a bunch of times on her own, and when we were listening to it together and kind of doing um, critiques, we did some, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one cr um, workshopping. You know, it was really, it was really apparent that she didn't have the confidence to project this information. So we did a little bit of guidance about how to present herself. And then she went back off into the galleries and recorded it by herself again. And it just came out so beautifully and, and emotional. Um, I just want to finish up by talking a little bit about the way in which um, the, the teens designed the delivery mechanism. So again, they got to decide how to do it. They decided they wanted to create postcards and a website on WordPress. Um, 
one of the teams was not particularly into audio, and so she really owned this project. She um, built the website, she did all the graphic um, representation with, you know, with some input from the museum, but um, she really kind of owned that and ran with it, and um, they created these QR codes. The teams decided that, again, that QR codes would be the most exciting for their peer audiences. I couldn't have been more surprised. Um, <laughs> that's not what I would have suggested, but again, I think this is about, you know, they're leading you and they're determining what works, and if and if it works or it doesn't, it really is about what they're doing. And I think, you know, the again, I don't know if I out outlined earlier, but one of the challenges of, for the Noguchi is that they don't really want any interpretation in the galleries of any kind. You know, there's no labels up. It's a very kind of um, aesthetic experience. And so this was really about getting other teams to get involved. They distributed the postcards at their school. They directed the people to the, you know, to the website where they could listen to the audio. And I think that, um, you know, the success of it is about them um, and their self-expression and about their um, feelings of accomplishment at the end of the process. And it's not about, you know, potentially gauging this in public impact. That, that wasn't part of the aims. And um, I think that's uh, probably where I will leave it so that we can have a little bit of time for discussion and for Rosanna to, to take off. But I'd be happy to talk more and um, share more audio at some point. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Rosanna's just reminding me, maybe <laughs> if there's specific questions about that project, we could take a couple now, if anybody has any. Yeah. Do you, do you guys have any I can speak to that very briefly. I thought it was very interesting because we really encouraged the teens to represent themselves in this project online and they did not want that at all. So even on the online um, uh, interface, it's represented by kind of a description of their project and not their names. There's no pictures. And part of that also is, you know, we were just sort of addressing this when we were thinking about the marketing around this, is that um, it's, it's complicated including images of teens, you know. I wouldn't make any yeah. assumption. I, yeah. I wouldn't make any assumptions about their comfort level of putting their own face um, in, in public ways, um, be various safety reasons and, and things like that too. But um, yeah. Wait, sorry. Yes, we, we let them all. I'm very. <laughs> <laughs> I did write a short bio uh, of them, and I think. But they've been involved with your program. Right. Yes. I think this is a big difference. Um, is well, that how yours is? Yes, they're involved with the program. So we document everything we do on site and post them into. Um, we have a, a web page for the teams, which is teams. .org. And we have galleries, if you will, of all the on-site programming and behind the scenes. Um, we do have all the team sign releases, and if they're not comfortable, of course, we won't document them. It's the same that we do with all of our sisters coming out. But in terms of the team online courses, we had them all write bios of themselves and we put them into a gallery. Um, and I think that's mostly because they're so happy to in all the videos. We wanted people to know who they were. But again, this is a private group. Um, after the course ends, the kids are no longer the um, course itself or won't have access to it. Um, so, you know, it's, if people are comfortable with it, we don't do it, but we still encourage them to do so if they want to. Um, so. Um, so, well, that's not, okay. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we have all the kids and their parents sign photo and video releases, but as far as putting their out there. Um, when we have those temporary labels in Gallery One that they wrote their name was on it, um, just their name, and uh, the videos that they create are on our website and our YouTube um, page. And um, what else? I mean, they make minds of each other, so they're in those mm -hmm. videos often. Um, but yeah, their names. No, but their names aren't in those. No. So, so yeah, um, the only place and all that where their name and is next to their face is in the YouTube video. Um, their name is like in the, you know, the bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think that I think also it might depend if you're doing online stuff on a state by state approach. Um, I know that in New York there are some very specific regulations about including images of teens online. So that's just something also to check with your legal department, even with release forms. That's very important.
Um, so in the spirit of co-creation, uh, the four of us had come up with a series of kind of key questions that I'd like to use these as a point of departure for the last 20 minutes of this panel. Um, and I'll go through them and then I'd like to talk through them and then also maybe put them to some of you all because I think some of the questions we've already had from the audience I think will help shape this. Um, the first question is how does inviting teens to co-create and engage with digital media help or meet, help to meet institutional program or program goals? Can digital media creation in museums enable authentically teen narratives? How do these narratives support or deflate larger museum goals? In what ways the adoption of new technologies used by teens, online tools, apps, social media, um, deemed a success or failure? And then how do we achieve long-term institutional support for teen programs and their engagements with digital media? Um, but I will confess that I am going to co-op this panel a little bit because um, I had the uh, pleasure of sitting through the very first session here at MCN about open authority and this look at redefining open authority in the museum and um, these five individuals who are really looking at what I think arrived in this, I actually fully asked <laughs> Beth for her slides of looking at this more nuanced um, approach of publicity, participatory, coll collaborative, and co-creative um, as a continuum that this idea of co-creation, which this panel is about, working with teens can actually be a very contested ground and that the assumptions that we're making about the ways that we're inviting teens into museums are by no means this um, uh, flat landscape and that I think some of the questions about dancing around what you're really doing when you're asking to invite teens to be co-creators in, in digital media that word invitation is in itself very fraught um, that often there are these kind of I think assumptions that when you invite a teen into or teen programs into your space you are asking teens to perform teen in the same way you're asking others to perform race or any of these other performative aspects. So I want us to be really careful. I mean, I think this is where it's a um, real privilege to be on a panel with people who are still doing this amazing work, because I'm not doing teen program work anymore. And it's, it's, I think, something that is so important to keep this language really quite critical when we're talking about um, working with teens. So um, I might just go through those questions, because I think that they're incredibly um, rich. And if we were to look at this idea of co-creation engagement in digital media to meet or institutional program goals. Um, I keep thinking about a lot of the phone calls that I've been getting recently, well, I'd say for four years now, since I left um, running teen programs at the ICA in Boston. Um, Hi, we want to do teen programs, and so like, how should we do this? Our director really wants to do this. And I'm like, I'm realizing now what I say is, what do you think someone saw? that they want to do this now. Mm -hmm. In 2014, where I think 10 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, teen programs were like really the cutting edge, and now we're kind of in a mature place for this, this field. Um, because I think that's an important question to ask your organizations when they're coming up with these newer, these newer ideas. Um, I am curious for the room. I mean, have you, have you seen places where teen programs have kind of come under this sort of suspect? spin? Are there ones that, because we all know that this is not something like every example of teen co-creation is like, bravo, we did it. We have teens here. It's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, but I do want to, I don't want to escape this opportunity to talk about it in this arena. <laughs> yeah.
something that I'm thinking about is that young people are already consuming the content that we're putting out for all audiences. Yep. On our website. And so I'm just really mindful of not wanting to kind of still continue bracketing teams. I absolutely agree, yeah. Um, and still wanting everything to be really relevant and accessible and not having any boundaries. But not saying this is not maybe just for young people. Anymore. Yep. Yeah. And something that I'm thinking about doing is actually Constructing that microphone Absolutely. Right. Why are we kind of pushing them into this? Absolutely. And that what happens at age 19 and a half, that's almost yeah. 20, that they're no longer, they've pretty much aged themselves out of your programs. Um, and I think in Allegra, similarly, like we had to draw a, a bracket around 13 to 19 since we were not working in a critical way with uh, young adults who did not go to college, for instance, or could not or would not go to college, it becomes actually unwieldy. But do you want to speak about that decision? Because it's a, yeah. it's like what happens next, but that other... Yeah. And especially without being 15 to 25. Exactly. Right. Which is a UK, it's also, I think, um, cultural, because we tend yeah. to go high school yeah. is, co is, is the same word for teen, but not all teens are in high school. Yeah. I mean, I think for us, when we first did this again, we were just experimenting with everything. Um, there really is a big difference between someone that's 13 and someone that's 19. Mm -hmm. And the types of the conversation, but also kind of the intimidation of communicating with someone that's older than you, like especially someone that's in college. And I think the other thing that we really wanted was to not only have this very open and accepting environment, but also to realize that studio art making courses they want, but you know, some high school art programs aren't that strong, or you know, students don't really have that outlet to go and explore museums as often as our New York City based teams are. So I think um, we just really wanted to make it I think having the people in college it was just it really shifted and they also were more confident and they were also dominating conversation. I mean, what's good about our LMS, uh, the management software that we use, it has a lot of flaws. Um, it's very user friendly. <laughs> um, but I think this idea with online learning and online courses, we always see a huge drop off rate. So when we first opened mm -hmm. this most recent course, um, the Next Generation New York, we had 476 posts in our discussion forum for the very first week. Uh, by week two, we had like 65. <laughs> so, you know, it, uh, there's always this drop off. And we also try to, to really play around with the types of questions we're asking the team. So one week was, is anyone here interested in being an artist? How are your parents receiving that? Because sometimes they're not really accepting of uh, kids that really want to go and do this as a career. Whereas other ones are like, who's your favorite artist? Like, post and share your work and tell us about it. Or like, what do you do for fun? Like, tell us more about yourself. And then we get into like more um, kind of traditional questions or prompts like, hey, you just watched a week's worth of content about non-traditional art. Make food art and post your photo here, you know? So um, it really, we're trying to be as sensitive as possible to the age groups we have, but that was like another reason why that kid wanted to do a video about art and pornography. We're like, no. <laughs> it's not going to work here. Um, but yeah, so I think it's definitely getting better to facilitate. Although I think that the UK does have a much more, um, uh, like a lot more direct language around programming for for anybody 19 to 25 or, or that, that secondary after high school, but not maybe working or in college, right? I think, yeah, I culturally. Think sort of have two programs, right. And then, yeah. A young adult program, and there's, yeah, there's other words to call it. Um, on our onsite programs too, for instance, you know, and so it's just, it's how it fits, it's teens, programs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so for us, um, the we, we at least try to have that interaction during family days, and maybe it's not teens working with yeah. young adults that are slightly older, but um, just trying to make them part of our, our culture in that way. Um, Seema?
or maybe about publicity. Yeah, I, I, I want to call it out. That, I don't think we have that. But okay. We have to hear more about the open ability and more about, um, you know, the, we have a full range of things. And the thing is that teens are different than adults. Teens are basically, we're at museums who are asking teens to perform, to perform being teens. Teens are, ask, are asking themselves to perform being adults. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, we, mm -hmm. we have special spaces for them to make it safe for them to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, even if they're using those resources, and they're using, um, I promise you, much scarier resources out there, um, the reason that museums have these safe spaces for them is because they're part of the institution. And the institution has to do that a lot with these safe spaces. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the challenge. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, but I'm also trying to push it a little bit further and yeah. say it doesn't have to be in this kind of ring area. And right. actually, the more we can embed that into the wider museum practice, Museum website and yeah. Space, you know, Can we get Laurie in? Yeah. I completely agree that there needs to be experimental spaces for everything. But some of the things that are But sometimes I feel as a content producer that other content producers across the organization will be like, oh no, that needs to sit on yeah. the yeah. 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 And that is, I mean, the, I will also yeah. be, I want to get to Laurie, but I also think that this exists in the silo of education. When it becomes digital, it's like suddenly everywhere. Yeah. It boomerangs out into the world, it comes back. And now everyone's noticing. Yeah. yeah. Lori, can we? I'd love to hear your voice. Oh, yeah. I keep saying, well, I'm trying to think through all these things and make sense. So just bear with me here on this one. But I was just really intrigued by this idea of um, you know, teens performing being teen and it being used to make your content relevant to that audience. Yeah. So, um, and I don't want to say this because it's being critical. It's really very savvy to do that. But are we being explicit in saying we're kind of using you to reach that audience? Like when teens are and not in these examples, but in examples that I have heard at the highest level of like, Rosanna, could you bring your teens so they could make us this thing? Because yeah. we're going to show it to our trustees and they're going to love it. And, and I, I can't believe that I still, after, after being in this space as an educator for like 22 years now, that I still go into this like really effing protective space of like, what are you really asking? And what, uh, what gaps am I filling? Or what gaps are these types of programs that I think are so critical are filling that's not being done by the whole organization, which any of us who've been to education conferences, this is a long-standing one. Right. I, I just have a quick thought on that, just as an observation. Um, you know, having been also a producer in this field for a little while, um, in terms of the teen space, what I've seen is the shift from. And this is why it's so exciting to do this panel with with these uh, examples and with Rosanna. The shift away from um, imposing message. I think that the question of performative is still really, really, I think, relevant. Um, but I think that one of the reasons I was so it, it impressed with the Noguchi's approach was really saying we're not going to push on a message here. They don't have to create something that is going to be public. This can be something which they're creating for themselves. They they actually self-determined that it was going to be for their peers. It didn't have to go to anybody at all. And I think that's actually giving that choice, I think, could be really um, instructive for other programs too. I've been involved in programs earlier where it's very much about message and about that public marketing element, which publicity. I think you're, publicity, I'm which you're talking about. I'm going to keep going with Beth's like, yeah. continuum. Um, it's, Right, and I, think, and I think there is a struggle between that and then also the relevancy question, which when I was talking with Chelsea Kelly about her program at Milwaukee, she was, she wrote that great post on art museum. Um, art teaching. Yeah, art teaching, and about the fact that it, she's looking for ways for it to demonstrate impact on other programming. So she was talking about the fact that it's, you know, now the subjects and the impact and the, the relevancy of her programs is being felt in the dose of programming and she's feeding back into the online collection. And I think it's important to, to address that question of where does that programming go? I'm very much for it being present, but I think there's that, that tension between it being present and what purpose it serves and protecting that, that safe space. Mm -hmm. Oh, just. Chelsea Kelly. Yeah. Um, and she writes a little bit on our museum teaching about yeah. um, some of her programming and yeah. evaluation. Um, yeah. As does Patty. <laughs> um, yeah. I just want to add, um, I was thinking about publicity. Um, we do experience some pushback because this program is really small and from up above 
child that looks like we're spending a lot of money on a very small group of kids. And so we get a lot of pressure to say, can you grow this program every year? Make it bigger, make it bigger. More teens, more teens. We want a teen night that has thousands of kids. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we fight really hard um, to push back. It's not that I'm necessarily against growing a program, but you know, it's just me and Seema and yeah. another staff member, and we want that, um, uh, that those hours of mentorship and close contact. Which I might take back to the, I'm going to skip over the, the third question, but the fourth question, this idea of long-term institutional support and what it really means for an organization to put their money where their mouth is when they're trying to engage this type of, any type of audience. Um, and in what way, when I keep hearing Allegra say, kind of in a throwaway way, but I think it is so critical, we paid them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are, um, I, I just don't want to make that like a light, Thing because I keep seeing I keep seeing things around like badges. I'm like, really? You guys think they want a badge <laughs> over money? Five. Well, <laughs> they want a stipend. They want paid for the work. They are doing a service for your organization. You've invited them in. Invited. Where's we'll that word again? Yeah. But I think that you're not. If you're not doing it in a way where there's this reciprocal respect, they're being treated like staff. You've charged them with huge amounts of responsibility. They are representing you to their peers. What they say about you is like critical to what, if you're trying to get a peer-to-peer -peer, um, set up, so. Well, I think, and that's really uh, that idea of being reciprocal, right? So we offer these programs to them for free, and they invest in it, and they mm -hmm. try to take as many courses as possible. Like again, we have three, over 300 applicants for 100 slots per season. And you know we can only select a few of them, but the fact that these kids keep trying and keep coming back, and then when we need to rely on them to help us create content for these online courses, they're giving back to us now. Yeah. Um, we provided a space for them, and now they're helping us provide a space for others. And I think you're right. I think the idea that we're paying them a small segment to help us create this content, but there's that elevated level of respect. And we're turning to them and saying, hey, we know you have great ideas. Like, let's work together and figure out how we can really bring this to a much wider audience. And you know, the fact that we have so many international students in this course too, like, it's great. Again, that little girl from Mexico coming up in a couple of weeks and wanting to connect with people. Like, mm -hmm. it's stories like that that are really exciting. To yep. us. And you know, we we didn't pay everyone to um, to lead the discussion after the course. Launched um, Emily, the one who featured in that baby that art video, uh, is our lead instructor, and we felt that she was really good at connecting with the teens and finding a way to spark discussion. She's in college now, but she <laughs> she lied about her age to get into our. I've program. had teens do this too. I've had so many the, years yeah. later. I'm like, wait, it's yeah. been five years. How are you still here? <laughs> living and working in New York um, and going to school. And you know, it's just, it's really incredible to see how dedicated she is. And we do have other kids pop in and they help facilitate discussion. We're not paying them now, but it's that idea that even though the course ended, and even though the course creation ended, they're still wanting to be a part of it. Yeah. And you know, I think that's a big success for us. And I think we view success in different ways. It's not really about numbers. It's not really about how many people from how many countries enrolled. It's, was it successful for you in creating this project? Did you get something out of it, number one? And is it successful for the students that are enrolled in the course? And what are they learning? And what are they bringing to the table? And um, you know, it's it's really amazing to see what these kids are coming up with and to be able to <coughs> give it to as many people as possible. I mean, again, with very little marketing, very little um, advertising, we, we've grown so far globally. And it's really just so incredible to see those connections I think, and Patty, your program's one year paid as well. I want to make sure, do you want to add anything? I know there's one more question. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, yeah, they are paid. They get um, stipend that's tied to project like, completion, um, because a lot of them also have volunteer hours that they have to complete for school, and so they are allowed to use that hours yep. in the program um, for that. But it's well. still an exchange. This yeah. is not like, why aren't they coming? We made all these cool teen programs. Why is no one here? Yeah. And not to say they all need to be paid, but their the service does. <laughs>
And I, can we, it's, it's the quality, quantity, and the visibility, though. And I think that getting to your point about the Tate, I just will say that, that when I've seen museums create opportunities where a team can come in their freshman or sophomore year, they grow with the organization, because they have a drop-in program, then become part of the Teen Arts Council, then they get into like, I mean, at the ICA, we enrolled them in a DJ school, and then they started DJing for our events, and then you see, and they get paid for that. So like, there, there's a progression where there's, there's somewhere else to go. They don't get just fully dropped or booted, but it's not for everyone to have a five-year commitment, so. It is tough when you want to accept as many people as possible, but I think another um, way that people are connecting is the fact that, again, we're respecting them, and we are paying them to be part of this institutional voice, but then we also give them um, the opportunity to take over our social media. Right? So their name is featured on our Facebook page. They're the ones posting on Tumblr, and I think the fact that we're giving them more and more responsibility and having us over and over and over again. I think that's really great. And you know, we again, these programs are free. We're not judging success by a monetary value here. We're not judging success by how many people involved in it. We're really judging success by seeing how and what they're creating, and the fact that they want to keep coming back for more. And did it, did it start out that way? I'm just thinking from like a mm -hmm. perspective. Um, I have to say, MoMA, our education department is really strong, and we really stress the importance of education. MoMA was founded within the educational charter um, when the institution first took off, and I think for that reason, amongst many others, we have a lot of support from above. And we have programs, we try to make this as accessible as possible, like we have some great community and access programs. Um, you know, touch tours, things like that, on site. But again, we're trying to build this community online. Um, with online courses, I mean, uh, this program has been around for four years. This is the first time we uh, kind of explored this idea of teen online courses. But we also did a partnership with Coursera to do MOOCs for our KB Which Allegra is talking about at 215. <laughs> 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 um, but no, it, those are all for. Professional development courses, and those are you know giving people access again and showing them how we teach on site and showing them that online. So, you know, and that's the visibility part that yeah. I think is not in your face of visibility. And I, the boomerang effect that I described, I hear more from like Middle East museums who say they need news about their museum to travel through Europe and America before anybody in their own community will notice. Mm -hmm. And that is the same thing that happens with teen programs. But let's be frank, the visibility is kind of the, the proof in, in many ways. So. Like Calder, who is our associate director of the teen programs, the reason he was so passionate about this is because he got involved in teen programs at the Walker when he was younger. And it was that moment, he said, that really changed everything for him and why he's so passionate about it and why he creates these fantastic programs that more and more people are coming in the world. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, sorry, sorry. All right, we're just going to finish up, but I just want to say one last thing about evaluation. Um, because program evaluation can be really difficult when your um, project is qualitative. And Chelsea Kelly writes um, recently about how she evaluates her program, and she works with Mariana Adams of Audience Focus, um, at least on the last evaluation. Um, for us, I mean, we have an in-house research team of two people, not three, but um, they do things like interviews, the journaling exercises, observations. Um, but for us, a lot of the time, it's the product. Um, mm -hmm. like the videos that we, we try to use as evidence of um, you know building communication skills and that sort of thing. So for us, um, the communication skills are probably one of the biggest outcomes um, that's important um, for the teams. Um, and this sounds silly, but attendance is a really important measure for us of um, success because we have kids, you know, we ask them to come back once a month. Um, and sometimes we don't see them that whole month before yeah. they do. And to get teams to show up to something can be um, Yeah, so, you know, just like how your comments dropped off. Um, the same thing. <laughs> so, um, so if we have all 10 or 11 students coming there on Sunday on time and not making an excuse at the last minute, then um, I really value that. Yeah, I think we should be <laughs> respectful of the next group. <laughs> Everybody show up for the 2 o'clock, 2.15 session, where is it?
Do we know? Per billion. Okay, so to carry on the conversation. <laughs> but thank you very much, everybody, again, for coming this morning. Thank you. So and for your questions. 9.30, you guys yeah. Woo!